Good morning, everyone. This has been quite dynamic. We had a great keynote speak speech by uh, Irvin uh, Henderson, and we thank you so much. And uh, you have really set the pace. And so I hope that we can continue with uh, the tenor of what you said as we start talking about really the history of Harlem. Uh, First, let me just say, welcome Harlem and friends of Harlem. Uh, it's good to see all of you here. And uh, many of us think we know Harlem's history, but we have three wonderful people who all three happen to be friends of mine, uh, who know so much about Harlem, and perhaps they will tell you something about Harlem that you d didn't know, are some aspect of the history that we find and uh, draw it out so that you will know more about it. So without any further elaboration, I would like to, what, what we're gonna do is ask each panelist to speak and after they speak, we'll have Q and A's and we have mics on each side of the room that you can use if you want to come up and ask a question. And then if we have time, I would like to engage the panelists in uh, a dialogue uh, about the subject of uh, this panel. Our first speaker is Andrew Dolcourt, who I first met, like I think, like in the late 1990s when I had uh, been hired as the executive director of the Mount Morris Park Community Improvement Association. And we were doing our uh, house tour, and we needed to get information about the houses that were on the tour. And they just said to me, oh, just call Andrew Dolcourt. I didn't know anything about, you know, like, call Andrew Dolcourt. Here's his telephone number. And so I called him up. And he was so gracious. He, and for years, he became my go-to person for information about the history of uh, houses and faith-based institutions in the Mount Mars Park community and uh, the historic district and uh, what was then uh, in the catchment area but wasn't quite the extension, which is now the extension. It took 44 years for it to get designated when they told people in 1973, oh, we'll come right back to it and we'll take care of it. 44 years later, in 2016, the uh, extension of the historic district uh, was uh, designated. Andrew is the go-to person for all of that information, but he's more than that. He, <laughs> he knows a lot about New York City architecture and the history, and uh, you can read his bio. I don't wanna elaborate on his bio. I just wanted to give you a little personal vignette of how I met him, and I have something like that for each one of you. Uh, so, Andrew's gonna start it out and he's gonna go to the podium uh, to uh, begin his presentation. Andrew Dokard. Thank you, Valerie. I'm gonna have you introduce me all the time. <laughs> um, so I'm really pleased uh, to be the, the lead off speaker uh, of, of, of today's panels. Uh, for what is really a giant step for preservation in Harlem. Uh, the fact that, that Harlem now has an advocacy organization with a staff that, that is so richly deserved. Um, I have been asked to sort of set the stage for today's, for today, speaking about the history of the architecture and development of Harlem, and I've been asked to do it in 15 minutes, which is a really tall order. Um, so I'll do my best, which is why I've written out the text, because so, there's a lot, uh, a lot that I want to go through. There we go. So, Harlem, or New Harlem as it was originally called, was a rural region encompassing much of northern Manhattan. Harlem was established as a Dutch farming village in 1658. Since slavery was a part of Dutch life in the New World, Harlem had a substantial African population from the inception of settlement. Geographically, Harlem was divided into a wetland to the east, the Harlem Plain in the center, and the heights to the west. By the 18th century, much of the land was was farmed or was owned by wealthy New Yorkers with country estates, especially on the heights, as you know, you know, Hamilton Grange. Uh, 
For about 200 years, from the Dutch settlement through the 1860s, Harlem remained a relatively quiet region, far from the bustle of the rapidly growing city at the southern end of Manhattan Island. By the early 19th century, when streets were mapped in Harlem as part of the 1811 grid plan that laid out the grid across Manhattan as far north as 155th Street, of course, the fact that the streets were mapped did not mean that they were actually there in reality. However, with the opening of the Harlem Line train along Park Avenue in the 1830s, which was very unreliable at first, but the eventual improvement of service, suburban houses began to appear in mid-century. And you, of course, you know these two really great houses um, in Harlem. But the, the one on your right is one of my favorite buildings. As the 19th century progressed, the Harlem farms became less and less economically viable and much of the land lay fallow. There was a great deal of land speculation with real estate speculators such as the Astor family buying property at low prices, banking on the fact that eventually the city would expand northward into Harlem and the value of their land would increase dramatically, which is of course exactly what happened. Since the farms in Harlem were no longer profitable and the new landowners bought with the intention of holding the land for future profit, little planned development occurred and poor people, mostly Irish and German, uh, many of whom lived on the fringes of the city in the 19th century, created unplanned communities that critics negative, who negatively referred to as shanty towns. Uh, and these are two in, in, that were in, in Harlem. A health inspector noted in 1866 that only a Third Avenue railroad car was more densely packed than a Harlem shanty town. As New York City's population grew and as residential development pushed northward on Manhattan Island, the urbanization of Harlem became inevitable. For several decades, speculative development was inhibited by a paucity of commuter transit links between Harlem and the business districts to the south. This changed dramatically in 1878 to 1880 when three elevated rail lines penetrated Harlem on 2nd, 3rd, and 8th avenues. The arrival of the L's precipitated more frantic land speculation and the new major residential construction. This is uh, the, the great S-curve that was uh, as the um, the 9th Avenue L moved eastward to 8th Avenue at 110th Street. Early construction occurred on sites convenient to the rail stations and included many brownstone fronted rows and of course the famous Astor Row, evident of the fact that the Astors were able to cash in on the land that, that, they, that they had held. The metamorphosis of Harlem into a prestigious residential community took place primarily in the late 1880s and early 1890s when handsome single family row houses and impressive churches and clubs arose throughout central Harlem. So that's what replaced that vacant land. Of course, all of you are familiar with the magnificent blocks of row houses in Harlem, many of which are now located in historic districts. Almost all of the row houses were built on speculation. Very few houses in Harlem were erected by individuals who, in, who intended to move into the completed building. The houses were put up by speculative builders who were, as I'm sure will come as no surprise to anybody, out to maximize their profit. Speculative builders were not erecting architectural masterpieces. Like speculative builders today, they wanted to erect houses at the lowest possible cost for the maximum profit. These builders knew, however, what the market demanded, and they built accordingly. They erected stylish houses with decorative flourishes and modern conveniences that were demanded of an upper middle class market. And speculative building was just exactly what it sounds like. A builder could make a substantial profit if the market was healthy and he could sell rapidly at a profit. But if there was an oversupply of dwellings or if the economy became depressed as it did in 1893, he could lose everything. And that is the story about Harlem's most famous housing project from this period, the King Model Houses, better known as Stryber's Row. These were built by builder David King to be model houses for the middle class and they were finished just as the economy collapsed. And he was able to sell seven of these houses before the Equitable Life Assurance Company took everything back. Uh, and Equitable owned them until 1919, and they built this building as their, as their real estate office. Uh, and this is the number one building in Harlem that I think should be a landmark. It's, it's like an aisle, everything around it practically is a landmark, but this building which is so intimately connected to the history of, of, of the King Model Houses. And on top of that, it has what, what I love so much about looking at, uh, at architecture and preservation and history, and especially true in Harlem, is that there is a layering of history. Uh, you have a really wonderful work of architecture that's really important to, to um, the, the history of, of, 
of the King Model Houses and Strivers Row. And then in 1923, it became the Coachman's Union League Society, as you can see in this famous photograph by James Van Der Zee. So it adds a really important African-American heritage issue on top of the, the early history and the architecture. And then later it became an American Legion Hall before it became the church that currently owns it. So we have a layering of, of, of histories here that make this building, to me, so incredibly compelling. The market in late 19th century Harlem was geared to attracting middle and upper middle class buyers. Harlem's comfortable houses attracted prosperous business and professional people. In Harlem, the vast majority of the new homeowners were American-born white Protestants, often with large multi-generational households, and one or more servants, generally from Ireland, Germany, or Sweden. All of the Harlem row houses were designed by architects. However, the speculative builders generally patronized architects who specialized in speculative row house construction. These architects generally did not have extensive training. Since there was no registration, it was easy for anyone to call himself, and it was always himself, an architect. The names of the architects responsible, <laughs> the names of the architects responsible for most of the Harlem row houses are not generally household names except in my household. Although not famous, many of these men were experts in their particular field. They knew what the market demanded, and they knew how to mix stylish features to create row houses that would attract affluent buyers. It is these little-known architects that we owe a great debt, for they created the look of Harlem. The new residents of Harlem established institutions in the neighborhood that catered to their religious and social needs. Since many Harlem inhabitants were quite prosperous, they could afford to commission noted architects to erect fine new churches, clubs, and other structures. Many of these were located on prestigious corner sites. The earliest religious structures were primarily Protestant church buildings that one would expect in an area of native-born white residents. By the turn of the century, the increasing presence of successful German immigrants is indicated in the addition of German Lutheran churches and German Jewish synagogues. Catholic churches of architectural distinction also appear in significant numbers at this time. Not all of Harlem's new residents lived in single-family houses. Coincident with the construction of row houses, a significant number of multiple dwellings were erected, with a boom occurring in the 1890s and first years of the 20th century. Oops. Some of these, such as those on the avenue south of 125th Street, are early examples of flats designed for middle-class families, while many others were working class tenements. Those, sorry. The ones on the right there are among my absolute favorite buildings uh, on, on the corner of St. Nicholas and 115th Street. The tenements of central Harlem are generally of a higher quality than those on the Lower East Side or in East Harlem and tended to attract civil servants and small business owners and other working class people. With the event, advent of apartment buildings and tenements in Harlem, immigrant groups established new ethnic enclaves and successful immigrants sought better housing. Poor Italians settled in large numbers in East Harlem, while Eastern European Jews moved onto streets in the southern part of the area with more affluent members of the community on Lenox and 7th Avenues just north of the park and poorer people farther east. A lot of this movement was precipitated by the city's announcement in the late 1890s that a subway would be constructed with a route north along Lenox Avenue, resulting in a boom in apartment house construction. By the first years of the 20th century, most of Harlem's land had been filled, and most of the older buildings that we see today had been erected, but Harlem's rich history had just begun. Others will be speaking about Harlem's African-American history and culture, so I will not deal with this in any detail. But suffice it to say that in the early 20th century, beginning in about 1904, Harlem rapidly transformed into the largest and most dynamic black community in America, the Mecca that we've heard about, with a mix of members of New York's historic black community, southern black migrants, and immigrants from the West Indies. This transformation was intimately wound up with real estate issues. And we're seeing on, your, on the picture on, on your left the Renaissance Ballroom, which we already heard, um, was sadly gone. As was true in earlier waves of population migration to Harlem, institutions followed the new residents to the neighborhood. In, in the 1920s, several of New York's most prestigious African-American church congregations moved to the neighborhood and erected new buildings. Some churches, such as St. Philip's, uh, commissioned new buildings from, from black architects, in this case, Vertner Tandy and George Foster Jr., while others, such as Abyssinian Baptist, hired white architects, Charles Bolton. In 
Most of these historic black churches are located on mid-block lots because corner lots were generally not available, or if they were, were far too expensive. Other congregations, both new and old, purchased the old buildings that were sold by the white congregations with, where they're, where they're, with their dwindling membership. And this is the same image that I showed you before, and the, you can see the date there is uh, when each of these buildings was purchased by an African-American congregation. And that's you know, a really telling way to understand how a neighborhood changes, uh, is to look at the, re at the evolution of the religious institutions. This provides an outline of Harlem's early history, a history that Save Harlem now is seeking to preserve. So how much is there still to designate in this neighborhood? There are, of course, historic districts and individual landmarks. Well, I would say that there's a lot. Uh, there are row house areas that are still uh, unpreserved, particularly the area around Manhattan Avenue, um, uh, which is a National Register district, but not a city district. There are multiple dwellings, uh, such as the Monterey, um, which, which you see here, and this is a favorite of mine, the Washington Irving, uh, with a bust of Washington Irving over the entrance. Uh, religious institutions, uh, All Saints Episcopal Church and uh, Calvary Methodist, not Salem Methodist, are, are not, uh, not protected uh, buildings, uh, as well as a number of the synagogues uh, that were built as, uh, uh, in, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. The one on the left, um, if you take that red paint off, it's actually a beige building with a pattern of, a, a diamond pattern of brickwork, and it, it would be absolutely magnificent um, if, if, if it were, were restored. Uh, along West 125th Street, some really important buildings, one of the northernmost cast iron buildings, um, in New York, which underwent a fantastic restoration about eight years ago uh, or so. You can see the before and after. Uh, or or uh, I don't know if this is Koch's or Coke's, uh, this department store uh, on 125th Street. Uh, and uh, the, the Blumstein's department store, which also brings up another layering of history. Not only is this a, an important work of architecture by important architects, Cone and Butler, but it also this was, was a, a major place for, for uh, the movement not to shop at places that wouldn't hire African Americans, uh, and you can hear see one of the broadsides uh, for that. But what and 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 um, this uh, bathhouse and and uh, natatorium. Whoops, I said natatorium there. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that and and of course important churches as well. But one of the things that I think that we really need to start uh, thinking about really seriously are A, the buildings that were, were designed by African-American architects, and two, the post-war buildings uh, in, in, in Harlem. So this is uh, the Elks Club. This is another building with, with a great sense of layering. This was built by a, an African-American Elks Club designed by Vertner Tandy, often called the first black architect registered uh, in, in, in New York. And then it has a, 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 a queer history layer on top of that because there were drag, very famous drag balls uh, here. So you know, on, on many levels, this is a really important building. And then you also want uh, the, the whole issue uh, that actually that you brought up about this being American history. And look at the, what the Elks Clubs chose to do is build a colonial revival uh, building. So there's a whole really interesting complexity uh, to this building. But let's, you know, let's think about the, the work that African-American architects did in the post-war period, that first generation of, of, of black architects to graduate from major uh, American architecture schools like uh, Eiffel and Johnson's um, community house for St. Phillips. St. Phillips is a landmark, but the community house is not uh, here. Uh, or the, the, the Los Angeles architect Paul Williams, who was brought to New York to design this public school on 127th Street with its great terracotta screens uh, here. Uh, or John Lewis Wilson, a, a, another a very early registered black architect uh, in New York who did this very much endangered um, church uh, here, uh, which is nestled in the midst of Lenox Terrace, which is an example of, of rethinking this as a Lenox Terrace, no, not a great work of architecture, but a really important cultural space uh, that, that I did the national, I did a, a, a national register nomination that got it eligible for listing uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, looking at, at various housing projects like Riverton Houses or uh, public housing projects like um, uh, Abraham Lincoln Houses, which Vertner Tandy uh, worked on, uh, or Martin Luther King Houses. I think we need to actually start looking at those kinds of buildings that many of us got into preservation to fight against, but now they're over 50 years old. Um, so you know, it's time to be thinking about 
about the, the importance of these things. Uh, and this, which is I love, uh, 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 Riverbend houses, even though it's had a very poor, the concrete's been really poorly restored. Uh, so there's a lot here in the history, and I'm, uh, I, I'm sorry I went through it so fast, uh, but it's, it's uh, always a pleasure to talk ab about Harlem and look to the future, uh, too, which I think is the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and I'm sure people will have many questions when we get to the Q&A session. Uh, next, we have Lana Turner, whom I met when I first moved to New York in 1977. Uh, the then executive director of the Studio Museum in Harlem had a dinner party and invited me, and Lana Turner was there. And Lana Turner had a car, and she gave me a ride from Brooklyn back over to Manhattan uh, from the party, and thus began our long friendship. Uh, Lana is, to me, like an icon uh, in uh, fashion-wise, cultural. She's very thoughtful about what culture means in Harlem and what it means to her. And she's often quoted and uh, featured as a uh, guest in documentaries about Harlem. And so it brings me great pleasure to introduce her uh, and great pleasure that she was able to join us to talk about another element of Harlem and its history, and that is its style and culture. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you, Andrew Dalcart. Um, he is. Uh, his books are books that I tend to use walking all over Manhattan, um, and particularly in Harlem, so I continue to refer to them. So I, too, have a tall order, and to talk to you in 15 minutes, I don't know how that's going to work, but I'm going to try. Uh, most of what I will show you in terms of slides really are just, um, think of them as just touch points because there were so many things that I wanted to cover, uh, and unfortunately, all of it's not going to be done, but I'm going to try. I don't think I can speak as quickly as Andrew, <laughs> but bear with me. So, I'm going to talk to you about um, both, mostly people and culture, but more from the standpoint of the Harlem Renaissance. That was one of the orders I was given. So I had to sort of cherry pick out of this tall list. Um, but I'm gonna speak a bit about places and to some extent people and why it was even the Renaissance in the first place. So everyone will have an idea about that. The first thing I want to do is to start out with what a lot of uh, historians there, there's a lot of back and forth with the historians about when the Harlem Renaissance started. But I think it would be to our advantage to start out with the Harlem Hellfighters and the fact that it was the eve of World War I that many people can point to. Um, you would hear words like the New Negro, which was used, terms used earlier than this time. But let's think about what happens with the Harlem Hellfighters, who uh, there's a group led by James Reese Europe, as you know, was a musician. Um, the black uh, soldiers who were recruited were not given the uh, training as white tr uh, uh, soldiers were given. And he did the best he could. He did a lot of you know, training up and down the streets of Harlem. Would you believe that? So. Uh, James Reese Europe goes off and the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th uh, Infantry, um, shows great valor as they're fighting alongside the French in Europe. This is interesting because the white servicemen will not allow the black servicemen to fight with them. So, But these men were in the trenches for, I think, 161 days, did not lose a person, 
and uh, were the great offensive. So the Harlem Hellfighters come back. It's 1919. It's February. It's cold. It's New York. And everyone has turned out to cheer them on. Oh, see, this is not good for me. All right, there we go. All right. Oh, there we are. So I'm going to say something to you that helps you to hear Harlem in a way. So you just pay attention to this. So there is when the Harlem Hellfighters are walking, uh, marching. They're marching to the music, which is just a march, right? So they get to, and they're marching up from lower Manhattan. They get to what is Harlem at Lenox Avenue and 130th Street. At this time, 130th Street is the southern border for Black Harlem. So, what do you think happens? Ah, would you just play that little audio for me? Thank you. Now, it's a little hard to hear that, but what I want you to imagine is that all the while, they have been walking through New York City, and they get to Harlem. There are thousands of people, thousands of people. They're family members, girlfriends, children. In fact, kids were given the day off on this day. And what happens? Everybody breaks rank because James Reese, James Reese Europe, breaks out into the song you just heard, very popular at the time, called Here Comes My Daddy. Now, I am sure when this song was written, which was very popular of the day, Daddy was probably referring to the white daddies. My daddy is here. But when it gets uptown, he tears that music up and jazzes it up. Here comes my daddy now. And all those women heard that. And they got out there and they started hugging those guys. People were cheering, throwing things off of the roofs. That's the tenor and the excitement of what happens on February the 12th, I think, 1919. It's the beginning of something. These men, for the first time, you know, they're the first time that wholesale, they have been taken back across the Atlantic. The first time was in chains. That's how we got here. This is the second time wholesale that black folks would move across the ocean and back. And when they came back, they were not the same people they were when they left. They expected something different. To some degree, perhaps a bit happened, but a lot did not. So, I won't go into the Red Summer. We're going to stay in Harlem. Okay. The Harlem Renaissance we think of as uh, the place for uh, literature and for uh, a number of the artists and the writers that we know something about. But what, in fact, was the Harlem Renaissance? Uh, it was intellectual. It was an artistic movement. It was progressive, and it was, and it was pr for progressive and socialist politics. It held economic promise. There was prohibition that was going on at the same time. But Harlem as a destination is something we should always think about. You know, people were uh, uh, migrating into other neighborhoods and other cities around the going north. But there was something about Harlem that would hold people into what? A place for transformation. We think you use the word Mecca. Mecca and uh, Andrew used the word Mecca, I think, as well. Mecca, 
um, not so much the religious aspect, but more secular. Secular and emotional. And it is a place where you can come and reinvent yourself. Most of the people we know about whose names stand out as part of the Harlem Renaissance did not always live in Harlem. They came from all over like the rest of our families. So getting back to the Great Migration or the black press, it's the black press that really underscores what is going on with what we think about the Harlem Renaissance. It is a flowering. It is a moment in which that did not exist before. So having said that, it is also a dialogue between the writers and the readers. That's what it's largely set up for. It did not have all the things we're thinking about. So I have up on the screen uh, the Crisis magazine. So I just want to sort of run through very quickly some of those, the press and periodicals and newspapers. The Crisis was founded in 1910. It's an organ of the NAACP. Uh, you probably know it was the editor, uh, W.B. Du Bois was the editor, and he appealed largely to a black middle class of readers. Um, he felt, as you know, he was about race politics, pan-Africanism, um, he was the one who espouses the talented tenth, and uh, interracial corporation uplift and civil rights, politics, politics. Opportunity Magazine, founded in 1922 as the organ of the National Urban League, uh, and its editor was Charles S. Johnson. Charles Johnson's very interesting, I'm gonna see if I can quickly run through this, but his idea was to make life better. So the end of the, uh, the uh, National Urban League, at least from uh, uh, Du Bois' standpoint, seemed like um, it was too slow. But, so the, but Charles Johnson, who had spent any number of years looking at organizations as a sociologist before he came to New York, uh, was one who understood that it was hard to break into the unions. It was hard to, for black folks to get in the unions. It was hard to get the sorts of things we needed to be a part of any uh, uh, community uplift. So he knew right away, one of the things he figured was, let's crack open the arts and the literature. That is, might be the way. And so he spends a good deal of time through the pages of opportunity doing just that. The Messenger, uh, let's see. The Messenger is and uh, was founded in 1917, and this is a periodical with a lot more, uh, rad uh, you know, it represented more radical thoughts of the Black movement. This was uh, uh, published by Chandler Owen and A. Philip Randolph, and it was a kind of literary magazine. But what it did do was to strengthen the African-American intellectual and political identity. Um, it also published essays, things like um, these colored USA or colored America, and essentially would have uh, essays to write specifically each month about one place in the United States where black folks were, or uh, someplace close by. So generally it tended to be uh, cities that you might find in that uh, organ. So he did publish uh, any number of other things. There were uh, literary people in it whose names you would know. Uh, but I'm going to run through the next one, and that is Negro World. You probably know Negro World was the organ for, let me hear it, who knows? Marcus Garvey, thank you very much. Marcus Garvey, um, 1918. It was, a, and this was a weekly newspaper. And of all of the periodicals that, uh, that I just spoke, spoke about, this one had the largest reach. Uh, Marcus Garvey was, uh, the, as you know, the founder of the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association. There were a number of editors who worked on the, um, the Negro world, depending on how long anybody could stand it. Um, but, you know, there was T. Thomas Fortune, there was uh, um, William Domingo, uh, Marcus Garvey edited himself along with his wife. Um, but it was a weekly newspaper. It focused on the arts, African-American culture, 
Um, there was a lot of commentary on theater and music books and certainly international activity, which is one of the reasons why it had that kind of large publication reach. Uh, the black press, extremely important. It would always chronicle, and for those who do research, you know how important the black press is. Every time I think about something and I'm looking it up, I have to go to the black press because they are the ones who would always chronicle what was going on in the street, what was going on in the community. Um, and so I can't emphasize enough how important they were, just in general. Uh, some of those newspapers, the Amsterdam News, which was started, started in 1909, actually started in San Juan Hill. I don't know how many of you got to Lincoln Center recently, but there was a whole piece on San Juan Hill. Uh, they started in 1910, 1909, and by 1910, a year later, I uh, had moved to Harlem. Uh, the New York Age, uh, it started in 1881. Um, and it ended in 1960. This was more the mouthpiece of Booker T. Washington. So while he was not physically in New York, he really was very much a part of what was going on. Uh, there were other national, there were national black publications, the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American. I want to say a little bit about churches and how important uh, churches were. In David Levering Lewis's uh, book, When Harlem Was in Vogue, he states, uh, for two varieties of Afro-American enterprises, churches and cabarets, money was especially abundant. Really important. Uh, the churches followed the congregants, and in decades, in decades, this long march from neighborhoods in uh, Harlem that were black neighborhoods initially, uh, from Five Points to Greenwich Village to the Tenderloin, San Juan Hill, uh, and, and to some extent Seneca Village, because it did have a church there or two. Um, this, oh, I wanted to go back and just say uh, St. Philip's, just is a bit about St. Philip's. I was happy to see it on your screen. I'm sure Michael will say something too. Uh, but it was very difficult for these churches to find their way into Harlem. Churches like St. Philip's had money. Uh, he was very, uh, uh, Bishop Hutchins was a very um, erudite, thoughtful, could plan, and was really thinking about what he was going to do to get into Harlem because it's sort of, he foreshadows this great migration. And it is, of course, he has Vertner Tandy, too, as was said, who was the architect uh, for this building. But it was uh, uh, Reverend uh, Butch Bishop Her Hutchins who actually bought 10 buildings on 135th Street. I recently wrote a short story, which is going into a uh, collection. And one of the pieces that I have in that, that uh, story has a lot to do with the buildings on, on 135th Street between 7th and Lenox. Uh, this is the neighborhood, this is the street that he purchases um, money, uh, bu buildings. And, you know, there are, and this is a moment, it's hard to imagine now because we cannot be moved out of our respective places just like that. But you could post a note and just say, if you have a building of white tenants, if you were a black landlord and you decided that, because there was so much prejudice and racial uh, uh, issues, that if you purchased a building and it was a totally white building, you could put up a notice and tell everyone they have to leave next week. Shocking, right? Well, that's what happened. Um, did they do that? Well, it did happen, of course. Um, I think about people like, um, Oh my goodness, uh, oh, I have to come back because I didn't write her name down. Uh, Hannah Elias, who uh, had a great deal of money, uh, who lived on Central Park West for a while. She did live in, San Juan, in the San Juan Hill area for a minute, but she lived on Central Park West, very wealthy black woman. She purchases buildings uh, on, she purchased first building on Lenox Avenue, about where the Salvation Army building is now. And, um, and she puts up a notice that says, this is going to be for colored residents, and people have to move. She buys another one 
a few years later on 135th Street, uh, which is right, uh, right, uh, right about where the schoolyard is uh, between Lenox and 7th. And notice goes up there as well because there were, this was at a time when there was so much struggle and strife with black folks finding a real place to live. Of course, Peyton was there to pay, uh, pave the way, um, thought of as the you know, godfather of real estate in New York, in Harlem. Uh, but then Nail and Parker come and they do similar and they, their firm actually lasts a much longer time. I'm going to keep going, right? Okay. Uh, we need to wrap it up. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Well, I have barely gotten there. But, but we I can can't... handle, you know, some of your additional <laughs> okay. material right. in the Q&A. Okay? okay. Well, let me just run through this quickly. I was going to say something about Salem and County Cullen, but I won't. Um, great migration. You get that. Uh, I was going to say something about that. Culture, a bit about style. Um, I don't know if I need to say a whole lot about that, but I do want to say something about what it meant to be on 7th Avenue um, after church on Sundays. In fact, six days a week, 7th Avenue was Harlem's Broadway. And 